who they support, we can brag on who we support. Amen? All right, here we go. Let's pray, and we're going to turn to Second John, which is al- almost to the end. Hang a right in Matthew and go almost to the end, and you'll be there. Second John, let's go before our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Again, Lord, I pray that we would humbly approach you, Lord God, in the way that you would want us to. Lord, there is nothing that we can do as far as approaching you if you have not given us the grace to do so. Father, cover us with your blood as we come before you and open your word tonight, Lord God. And I thank you so much for the body of Christ. Lord God, I thank you for the body that you paid for with your blood. Lord God, that you left as a vehicle to be the ministration of the gospel, Lord. Lord, we open your word tonight with expectancy. Lord, reveal to us your truth. We bless you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, 2 John is where we're going to be at. And I'm excited about this sermon for tonight, something the Lord's put on my heart. And uh, it's, it's a short book, which is kind of cool. You know, you can read it in maybe 10 or 15 minutes, which is all right. You can say, you know, I've, I've had a quiet time, and I've been in there for a week. And it's like, dude, I read a whole book of the Bible, and it's First John. You can feel you know, validated because you read an actual book of the Bible. And I love John and his heart. Dude, John's heart is all about love. You guys know if you've read anything of the Apostle John, it is all about love. I got to get there in my notes real quick as you guys are flipping there. And this is almost, this is one of those weird letters. You guys ever read those stories on the news where somebody likes cracking through the sheetrock in their house and they find these old World War II letters and they deliver them to somebody years and years later? I think that stuff is cool. It has nothing to do with tonight's sermon, but I think that stuff is cool. But John, this letter to Second John, it's, it's like one of those letters that you would find in Sheetrock, and you're like, who does this even belong to? It's the weirdest letter, and it's just like to the elect lady, and he, it's just weird, right? But one of the catchphrases that he says in this chapter, it's the only one chapter, at the end of the chapter, he says, I have much to say. So the title of tonight's sermon is, I have much to say. And some of you guys are like, dude, that's the worst thing a pastor could ever say at the beginning of a sermon. I have much to say, right? I got much to say. That's the title of tonight's sermon. We're going to jump into it real quick, give you a little bit of background. Uh, as you see in verse 1 of, of 2 John, he, they call him the elder. He's the elder. John is like surpassed all of his homie apostles, okay? He's like the Hulk, all right? You can't kill this guy. You really, you, you just couldn't. That's probably a bad analogy. Actually, he was a son of thunder, so it kind of fits, right? John was like the incredible Hulk. You just couldn't kill him. But he was also loving, like... Bruce, you know, Bruce Banner was, right? So it's kind of a, a good mix right there. And I bet, I wonder, wonder what it was like when Jesus was around and, and the Apostle John's like, let me call down fire and, and strike them, Lord. And Jesus is like, hold up. You're going to be the Apostle of love one day. You've got to calm down. And, you know, what was that like as they're interacting together, right? But he was just this crazy guy, and, and they couldn't kill him. So we, they think the, the letter was written uh, 94 to 97 A.D., which is kind of late, but there was all this persecution going on and everything like that, and they just couldn't kill John. He's just like, man, he's just untouchable. And so I'm definitely, when I get to heaven, you guys know there's just going to be certain things I want to look at, I want to see. This is one of them. Like when they dropped him in oil and he didn't boil, did his skin crackle, and he was just like, I'm good. Turn up the heat, you know? What, what was it like? They Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or like they're walking around in the fire. Were they warm at all? Were they sweating? It says their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. I want to know, okay? Anyway, so they couldn't kill him. They dropped him in hot oil. They couldn't get, kill him. Second John says, greeting to the elect lady. Okay, now here's the deal. All right, one of two scenarios with the lady. Either it says, let's just look at verse 1. Look at verse 1 in, in Second John. It says, a greeting to the elect lady uh, and her children, whom I love in truth. Not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and with us forever. One of two options. Either this elect lady has a grip load of kids and she's like the old woman who lived in a shoe. You guys remember the old woman who lived in a shoe? Listen to this. I've never read the poem. This is a cool poem. It has nothing to do with tonight's sermon. I want you to hear this poem. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. I'm there with her right now. Listen to this next part of this nursery rhyme. This is a nursery rhyme. She gave them some broth without any bread, whipped them all soundly, and put them to bed. That's my kind of woman, bro. This is my kind of woman right here. She's got kids she don't know what to do with. She whipped them all soundly, gave them some broth, sent them to bed. Y'all get in bed. I'm like, in the name of Jesus, man, that is awesome. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, so option one. Excuse me. She's either this woman that has a grip load of kids or what I think, this is my personal opinion, John, during the midst of persecution, is addressing the church as an elect lady and her children, right? 
And I kind of think that's cool, kind of going like incognito, right? You know, persecution. And he's trying to protect people's, I don't know, it could be. So if he says later at the end of the chapter, the um, sister of your elect, your elect sister greets you, right? And I'm like, that kind of be cool if, if it was another church greeting another church. So wh- whoever the elect lady is, John wrote a letter to her, and that's pretty much all we know, okay? I can't give you, where the Bible's silent, I'm going to be too. I'm, just all there is to it, okay? So uh, John wrote this letter to her, and he gives, it's, it's short. But, I, but it's a power punch right to your face. If you know anything about the gospel, this is a huge power punch. And let's get right into it. Like you heard, verse 1 and 2, we'll pick it up right here, verse 3. John says this, Grace and mercy and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive the commandment from the Father. Here's verse 5. And now I plead with you, lady... Not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which you have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Guys, I want to encourage you with this. Sometimes you're going to be in churches one day where there's not a lot of reading of the scripture. Okay, And, and you know, the, the Lord can move sometimes like that. That's, that's totally okay, but here's what I believe. Always condition yourself to, to appreciate just the Word of God. What would happen if a pastor read the Word of God and walked away from the pulpit? One of these days I'm going to do it, Caleb, I'm telling you. Well, just, we, were, we were at a men's conference. This is just unrelated. We were at a men's conference, and Raul Reese got up, and I mean, he, I, <laughs> visibly, visibly disturbed over what he was reading, affected by the Word of God, snotting all into his microphone repeatedly. But face down, read the Word of God, no commentary, and got down. Always train yourself to appreciate the Word of God and the Word of God alone, okay? So anyway, just a little side plug, and uh, it's valuable. It's the Word of God. It's living, breathing, powerful, sharp with any two-edged sword, able to cut through the marrow of our heart, amen? It's a real, real, real thing. Anyway, so he says this. It's good to see that some of your children are walking in truth. They're walking in love. And as a pastor for the elder John, that's all he wanted to see, right? That the people of the church were walking in love. And for me, I've been a pastor for a little bit. That's what I want to see too. Dude, Katie and I love it when people get it. When we're sitting down at a table at Lizard Stigget, or we're, you're at our house and you're watching my babies running around butt naked because their diapers got so full they just fell off, and, and we're just hanging out, and then, and then the, the light bulb goes off, and you're like, dude, I get it. We love to see the light bulb go off for people. And I can kind of relate to John on this getting it, all right? So I, and John says, I love to see that people are walking in love. Guys, I see love sometimes in the church. Sometimes it looks a little bit like Nicholas Sparks, but I see love, and you guys know who Nicholas Sparks is, right? He wrote The Notebook. Sometimes the love that I see in the church looks a little bit like The Notebook and not like the love of Christ, but that, you know, that is, sometimes it's Fifty Shades of the Church. It's a bad one. Sorry. That's, that's bad. <laughs> right? I'm just saying. We see love all the time, but sometimes it's the wrong type of love inside the church, right? Am I wrong? You guys understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you've been in church, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes that's the type of love that we see floating around the church. So that, that leads me right into my point number one. Here comes a blank. The best way to welcome people into the house of faith so that they feel wanted is to love with the love of Christ. Can I get an amen from anybody who agrees with that statement? The best way to welcome somebody and make them feel wanted is to love them with the love of the Christ. Not a no- notebook kind of love, amen? Not no, not no Fifty Shades of the Church type of love. And it, 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 uh, love them with the love of the church, right? With the love of Christ. Letter A, we can become, here it is, an entrance or an exit to the house of faith based on how we love. Would you guys agree with that statement? That we can become an entrance or an exit to the house of faith. Ezekiel 44 is the scripture reference for that. And uh, I was sharing with the leaders earlier about the entrances and exits. And you'll see it right there on the screen behind me. That the angel of the Lord told Ezekiel to measure and mark the entrances and exits to the house of the Lord. And here's what I told the leaders earlier on at 5 o'clock. That... That with how we love, listen to me, with how we love, Caleb, we can be an entrance or an exit to the house of the Lord. Whether we love or we don't love. Would you guys agree that that people would say, because they didn't love me, they became an exit in my life and I don't want to go to church anymore. Or if they did love me, they felt accepted, right? That actually the whole idea of entrance and exit came from P.D. Amber and he... He, he's the one that came up with that. Take your notepad. I'm telling you, this stuff is gold. He's gonna, when you go to experience, he's got all this stuff. And, 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 and entrances and exits has resonated within my spirit because, guys, 
God forbid that I'm the reason somebody doesn't come back to church, right? God forbid that because I don't love them, they don't want to come to church again. Because I don't go out of my way to speak to them that they're saying, well, I've got nothing to do with the church. Does anybody have friends that say, uh, well, the church is full of hypocrites? Church is just full of jerks, right? They're just a whole bunch of loser hypocrites that are in the church. I don't want anything to do with that. God forbid that I'm that reason, okay, that I'm the, the exit for them. You know what I mean? I don't want that in my life, all right? So uh, letter, letter A, we can become an entrance or an exit to the house of faith based on how we love. Letter B, are you, am I going fast? Are you guys good? Are we okay? Whew. All right. Letter B, people will or won't see God, the God you serve, based off the words that you say. People will or won't see the God you serve based off the words you say. Guys, that applies everywhere. That applies at your job. Listen, I'm married now, and my wife will or won't see Christ based on what I say and how I love her. You guys understand what I mean? And I don't want to be a a, a jerk-faced husband. But my wife will or won't see Christ based on how her shepherd and pastor administers Christ to her and how I love. John 15, 12 through 13, you can follow with me on the board. This is my commandment. You've heard this, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. The disciples, after Jesus was dead, knew this was a death wish. Jesus, you want us to love like you? Guys, the truth of love is laying down your life and dying to yourself. It is others before you, all right? And Jesus said, love like I love. Uh, listen, the, here, and, and when Jesus said, love like I love, we can, we can say that now because, listen, people respond to the love of Jesus because you know why? It doesn't condemn them for their faults. It doesn't put sin up in their face. It doesn't put judgment and condemnation up in their face. The love of Jesus Christ is gracious and kind and compels people, amen? Right? That's what the scriptures say. First Corinthians says this about the love of Christ. You guys know it. We got some weddings coming up. Amen. I'm going to be doing uh, 1 Corinthians 13 at a bunch of these weddings. So you guys just get, memorize this passage, okay? Love suffers long. Everybody reads these passages at weddings. Love does not envy. But do you ever stop to say law on this passage? Put it on a marriage. Put it on a relationship. Put it on loving another person. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Come on now. Right? Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. So when you love with the love of Christ, and a non-believer comes in, and you put 1 Corinthians 13 over them, they're like, hold up, what just hit me in the face, right? Because the love of Jesus Christ is good. The love of Christ is compelling. It is not harsh, okay? Let her see in your notes, and, and this is so good. This comes from Levi Lesko, and when Levi Lesko said this, it just like, it smacked me because I was like, you know, I've never really thought about this concept. I hear it in church, but the concept hit me hard. Let her see in your notes. The greatest sermon your life will ever preach is how you love those who are different from you. The podcast of your life. And he's, Levi Lesko said that your life is always on podcast. It's on, it's on play, right? Is that true? Is that true or not? You guys understand what I'm talking about? John 13, 35 says all men will know that by your love, right? All men will know by your love. 1 John 4, 7 says, let us love one another, for love is of God. What type of podcast are you playing? Tough one right here. Tough one. Maybe not for you guys. Maybe for me. All right? Let me just be real and honest and authentic with you guys, okay? This is a tough one for me. How many guys have let that podcast play when you're on the road? Man, and that person, they did did that that move, okay? How about about when it's a four-lane road and you're making a left-hand turn? And there's a median in the middle, right, for those of you that drive. There's a median in the middle. You make the left-hand turn, and there's no other cars on the far right lane, but the left lane is just, you can't merge over. And I'm like, why don't y'all just get over one lane and let me out? So I'll sit there on highway number one, frustrated, frustrated. And I'm like, why in the world just go over one more lane? How many guys let that podcast play? Right? And by the time you finally merge onto number one, you've gripped your steering wheel so tight. You're do, you're, it's like, what is going on right here? And you're like, get over! And the kids are in the back, Daddy, who are you mad at? Nobody! Them! Right? And that podcast is playing. It is playing on loud, too. I don't care what song is coming out of my stereo. The podcast is playing. Lily's like, who are you yelling at? I'm like, nobody! Be quiet! And I'm, it's, not, it's not like that, but in, in that situation, you know, that, that's what I, I, I'm feeling, the anger, right? 
You guys don't have to front with me. There ain't no future in front. You've been there too. You know, your big Bibles ain't full of nobody. You've been there too. A little bit of road rage. You don't have to lie in church. Come on now. You've been there. A little bit of road rage. Listen, how many of us have let the podcast play on our Twitter account or news feeds, right? Where you, you post something or tweet something and you are letting some, some ventilation steam off and you are letting it go, right? And Dr. Phil reads it and he's like, whoo, got to schedule an appointment with this person. Dr. Phil needs to call in on that one. And, and how many of us have let the podcast play negatively on our news feeds and on our, our internet accounts? And you just let, or in a text message where somebody, somebody wrongs you, oh man, and you just got those thumbs rolling, right? And you got that thumb rolling, you were going to give them everything that you felt right at that moment. You were going to let them know the podcast is always playing in your life. What kind of song is coming out? Right? You can be an entrance or an exit based on how you love. Okay? You can be an entrance or an exit based on how you love. How about this one for some of you guys that are still in this season of life? How many of you have let the podcast play when your parents tell you no, that you wanted something? Now, I've seen this one. I've been in youth ministry for a while. I've seen this one. Here at church, mom and daddy tell you no or something, or you can't go to the mall with sugar pie, and and honey boo boo's not coming over to your house Friday night, and it's just not going to be a good week. And all of a sudden, this neck vein starts rolling. It's like, dude, it's pulsing. I'm like, man, what is about to happen? It's going to be serious, and I want to watch it. All right? And it's it's all coming out, and they're, they're getting so agitated and upset because of what their parents said. It's hilarious to me. I see it. How many of us have let that podcast play, right? What is coming out of your podcast? John says this. It's good to see people loving. It is evidence of Jesus Christ. Here's how he backs that up. Back in the book, verse 7. I was going to say chapter 7. There's only one chapter. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose the things that we have worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Verse 9, whoever transgresses and and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Hard words. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive them into your house, nor greet them. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Hard words from the the guy that is supposed to be the apostle of love. But I want to, I want to, I want to validate this real quick. The, the last couple of verses that we read before verse 7 were about what? What did we spend the last 10 or so minutes talking about? Oh, man. Gracious. Nobody remembers 10 minutes ago. Ah, I need to talk louder. <laughs> we talked about love, right? Podcast or something. I remember something about a podcast and music or something. I don't know. And Twitter, anyway, we're talking about love, right? So in the first couple passages, verses of this passage, he's talking about love. And then he says this, he makes this shift, and he says, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess that Jesus is the Christ. John is writing a letter to people who were confused about what people were saying about Jesus. Is that today? Do we, find, do we know people that were just like everybody saying different things about Jesus and faith and Islam and ISIS and what the world is about and which religion is right and what is going on and who's going to deflate the footballs for the Super Bowl, love you, Justin, and what is happening in the world, right? Everybody's got these opinions, right? Okay, here's what John is saying. By this, all men will know that you were my disciples. By what? Your love one for another. The podcast is playing. Check me, with me. The podcast is playing. How will you know a deceiver from someone who's trying to speak the truth? Because, guys, there are people in pulpits everywhere and in churches everywhere who are ministering, teaching, evangelizing, serving, cleaning toilets, vacuuming, making coffee, shaking hands, handing out bulletins, flipping light switches, everywhere that are not practicing love. Am I right? Caleb, you know what I'm talking about? Am I right? Dude, honestly, there are people inside churches that you know of that are not practicing like that. And John says, how will you know if someone is a deceiver? Contextually, he's talking about the body of Christ and them being able to discern who is really on the side of Jesus Christ. I think it's a good litmus test. Their doctrine might be here or there. They might say this or preach good or whatever. How does their content match? How does their content match their character? You guys know what I mean? How does their content match? match their character. They might be, listen, they, 
They might be the best Christian you've ever seen. But if you upset them, are they going to have the neck vein like the Nile River running up their forehead? You know, are they, are they going to explode? How does their content match their character? Does, do you understand what I mean? That, the John is saying, this is how you're going to know if someone is false. If they're, they're claiming these things, check them next to their love. Are they loving people? Are they love? And that's a great litmus test for us, guys. Are, are we, we claim to be the church. We claim to be the indestructible church of Christ that the gates of hell won't prevail against, yet we have a hard time loving people sometimes. It, do, do we not? That the church has a hard time because we hold grudges, we have cliques, we have, we have things where we won't talk to people and we'll go out of our way to avoid talking to people. And in the heart that I have for the house like we talked about last week, that is not so. I don't believe that's of God, that we have cliques and formalities and sections of the church. I don't, I don't believe in that. John says you'll be able to know them by their love. Number two, here we go. Moving quickly. Number two, here comes a blank. Many people within the church have stopped carrying the heart and have replaced it with the hammer. I thought that was an interesting point. Nigel, do you like that one? I kind of like this one. Maybe not because it's something I'm fond of, but it's because of what I see so often. Does anybody know anybody who is so ready to swing a hammer on somebody? Swing a hammer on somebody who's struggling. And I don't know who said it. I couldn't find out who said it on the Internet. But Christianity is one of the only religions that shoots their wounded Dad, have you heard that before? Somebody, I don't know who said it before, but we shoot our wounded. Somebody who is, they're, they're struggling. They want to do the right thing, but they've been caught in a cycle of sin. Or they've been in an immoral lifestyle, and they've just been, had their head kicked in by the devil. And they don't know how to get back into worship. They've got so much one direction of Taylor Swift floating around. They couldn't get back to worship music if they wanted to, right? And they're just, they're, they're needing someone to pull them up and be an account ISI to them, right, girls? They're needing to pull them up and be ISI with them and strengthen them and all of a sudden they're just blindsided by life and don't know how to do it and we're like you know what you're not living right you can't come to our church you can't hang with us you can't come to my house because you have habits or something you can't hang out with the other believers because you have a language problem or you you know what I mean we're the only ones that shoot our wounded many people within the church have stopped carrying the heart and have replaced it with a hammer John says check their doctrine next to how they love people Man, let it never be said of anybody in this room that you didn't love enough, but you had the right doctrine. You had the the right doctrine, but your love was way off. And we've heard it before. Paul says it. It's a clanging symbol. One time in this church, I set it up out here. I brought it from my drum cage, and they're all cracking now and and getting all old, and it's a sad thing, Ben Todd, but one day I'll get a new one. Anyway, so I set the symbol up here, and I tried to talk over the clanging of the symbol, and it was just noise. It was, it was useless. That's how our life is portrayed when we don't love. We can have every right thing going for us, be doing all the right things, get in the Bible every single day, have worship going, have Bible going, have accountability going, and not love and not be worth a thing. Is that true? And guys, this is where I am like, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Because... I am the person that lets the neck vein out. I'll, I, let, I let Hulkamania run wild, okay? And, and, I, and the, the Holy Spirit in me, that's the work that he has to do in me. When I surrender my life, I'm, I'm surrendering the, the desire not to punch bricks, okay? And I'm like, you know, and I work at prison, okay? My uncle's here, and he's worked in prison before. And sometimes these guys have devised ways not to physically hurt me sometimes, but to get right under my skin and sit there and dig around. They know exactly what to say to me. And they're incarcerated, and I shouldn't let somebody who's behind bars be that much of a potent problem in my life. But I'm like, ah, that hurts. Why do they bother me so much, you know? And, and I have to release myself, say, Lord God, have control of my emotions, have control of my heart right now, and not carry a hammer around. John says, you'll know them by your love. You'll know them by their love. He says, beware of the false doctrines. Check their content next to their character. Letter A, you will know the ones who teach the doctrine of Jesus by the ones who look most like Jesus. Have you ever been around somebody who, who looks like Jesus? Who looks like Jesus? I'm not talking about hippie Jesus, right? Who looks like Jesus? Because there's a lot of people. The, the lead singer for uh, City Point looks just like Jesus. If Jesus were in a picture, that would be him, you know? And then there was Jim Caviezel, right? The Passion of the Christ guy. You know, and now I'm like, man, I can't get it out of my head. It's Jim Caviezel. I'm, I'm praying, and there's Jim Caviezel up in my head. It's not how it's supposed to be. He's Hebrew. It's different, right? He's an unrecognizable man. He's just common looking, right? That's what Isaiah says. I'm like, get out of my head, Mel Gibson, in your movie. Stink, you know? Anyway, 
I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> Letter A, you will know the ones who teach the doctrine of Jesus by the ones who look most like Jesus. Listen, the people who spend time with Jesus are going to love like Jesus. True? Amen. Here we go. Keep rolling. If our con- content doesn't match our character, or if what we preach doesn't match what we practice, we have become an excuse for people or an exit for people. Let me explain this. Letter B, people become the excuse or the exit when they drift away from the call of Christ and begin to answer the call of the culture. When they drift away from the call of Christ and begin to answer the call of the culture. Here's here's what I wrote down and we're almost done. We become the excuse for people to leave saying the church is full of hypocrites because of the way this person acted. And we become the excuse. How about this? We become the excuse or the exit for people when we don't practice what we preach. And they say, well, I can do it because they do it. And we become the excuse. We become the validation for sin. Because people are watching you to see how you live because you claim the name of Jesus Christ. We become the excuse for people not to go deeper in their relationship with Christ because you've been a Christian for so long and you're doing okay. And we become the excuse for them not to go deeper. Because, hey, they've been saved 10 years, and they're still doing the same things I'm doing, so it must be the normal level of Christianity. Does that make sense to you guys? Listen, we become the excuse and, and, and reason and exit for people to exit the family of faith when we do not love like Christ called us to love, when we carry grudges and we have bitterness built up inside of us. How can we be ambassadors for Christ when we're carrying a grudge? How can we be an ambassador for Jesus Christ when we're harboring bitterness in our heart? When the love of God comes in and cleanses us from unrighteousness, do we hold on to the pockets of bitterness and contempt for people? Or do we let that go as well? I just wrote this one down. How can we be ambassadors for Christ when we're sleeping with people who come to the church? How can we preach the gospel and play the game? Am I the only person that knows people like this? How how can we claim anguish over sin but because of sin, still live in anger. We become the excuse for people to leave and not see the Savior when we don't give our time fully to Christ and let him have control of our life. We become the excuse and the exit for people when we have bootleg commitment to Christ. Penn and Teller said it on the video that we saw recently. Penn, is that his name? Penn, I don't know his first name, Penn, the guy who reveals the magic tricks. And he was talking about the fact that if Christians really believed in the, in the reality of hell, what different kind of life we would have. And that always bothered me when people said it, but I understand where he's coming from. Okay, I understand where he's coming from. We become the excuse for people and the exit when we have a bootleg commitment to Christ. In the SCSL, they'll say bought and borrowed. That's something that PD always says, bought and borrowed. And it's the same concept, okay? When you have a bootleg commitment to Christ, you're borrowing the belief system and you're not buying in. You become the excuse for people not to buy in. You become the validation. They say, so-and-so did it, and they're just, they're okay, right? I do not want to be, and, and I pray that you don't want to be the excuse for someone not to come closer to Christ. And you don't be the exit for them to leave the family of faith, Amen. That's not what we're called to be as believers in Christ. We're called to be entrances to the family of faith, all right? Entrances. And John says, the entrance is love. By this they'll know, love. And you know what? And, it, and, and I've been in, teaching the Bible for a while, guys, now. And listen, love is a universal Tylenol and fix. I don't want to say Tylenol because Tylenol doesn't fix it, right? Tylenol just kind of alleviates it. But, but love, it, it, it's so many of the problems that I face now are answered. And Paul, Paul had it, man. That's, anyway, another sermon, another time, another place, right? Here we go, last couple of verses, and we're done. Verse 12, having many things to write to you. There's the whole title of the sermon. I, an introduction right there, guys, we're done. All right, now time for the sermon. Here we go, verse 12. Having many things to write to you. Uh, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be full. Uh, verse 13, the children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Hey, you just read a whole book of the Bible. Congratulations, you know. I've been in first time. Anyway, you read a whole book of the Bible. That's a good thing, right? You know, it doesn't return void. So he says this, having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink. Number three, here comes the last blank. We always have much to say, but how we live will often determine how much they hear. John says, I have many things to say to you, but I would rather come to you 
and speak face to face. What was John saying? What is he saying right here? He's talking about love. He's talking about how you will know the doctrine of people based on how they love. And he says, I've got a lot I could say, but I'd rather come to you and be an example of how to do it and how to live and how to love. He's saying this. He's saying basically that I could come to you and with the life that I live towards Christ, I could speak more than I could write to you. And it's a short little letter, and he said so much with that. It's a short, tiny little letter. He could have written a huge book, but some examples are better caught than taught. And he says, I've got much I want to say, but I'd rather come and and be uh, an example with you. His face-to-face example was worth a thousand words. My face-to-face example is worth a thousand apologies because I'm a failure sometimes, and I, I apologize often for things that I shouldn't have said. You guys ever go, man, I shouldn't have said that. Or maybe you're the type of person that says, oh, next time I, I got something, I'm going to say it in. You know, maybe you're the type of person that says, if, I, if that conversation happens again, I'll have the words then. Nine times out of ten, I'm the person that has to apologize for the things I did say because I spoke uh, crassly or I spoke uh, out of my flesh or... I spoke out of my hat, which is to say very quickly, and I didn't think about it. Letter A, we can preach all the time and use our words when we need to. For those of us that have jobs, that's heavy, right? Even if you're in a Christian school or you're in a place like SESL or uh, going back to Bible College, Sarah, wherever you may be, we can preach all the time, even to believers, right? Do believers need to, to see the example of Jesus Christ? Amen, they do. Amen. Yes, they do. All right, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men they see your good deeds and glorify Father in heaven. 1 Peter 2, 12, the scriptures, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. We become the examples to the believers. Here's what I wrote down a couple examples. We become sometimes not the examples of Christ, but more the examples of how to lose a guy in 10 days or maybe how to keep a guy in 10 days, if that's the struggle, you know? How to keep a guy for 10 days. We become the roadmap of mediocrity for people that want to burn. That one convicted me a little bit, Caleb. I was just like, we become the roadmap of mediocrity for the people that want to burn. They want to burn. They want to light themselves on fire because of my mediocrity, they calm down. Man. Letter B. Our character and Christ-like compassion will be what compels people to the cross. Sermons don't save people. My sermons don't save people. And I just thought it was funny, you know. I I almost just should have more fun with my sermons because all the pressure's off of me. It's on the Holy Spirit to do the work anyway. And, and, you know, it's like just have fun, you know. Like I should just cut loose a little bit more of my sermons because he's going to take care of it anyway. He's he's responsible for the growth. He's responsible for the, the seed taking root. He's responsible for the salvation. I'm like, you know what, I should just get up here and have a good time and not worry so much. So next time, I'm telling you, I'm t- next time I'm just cutting loose. And, and you know what, I, I probably shouldn't joke like this, but God's like, oh, man, I'm following up Nate. Gabriel, Michael, come on. We got work to do. We got, we got, we got work to do. Get down there and help out because Nate's doing something crazy again. But sermons don't save people. It is the Christ-like character that compels people to the cross. They see your love and say, man, there is something about you that's different. It's not... You understand what I mean, guys? It's not church services like this that save people. It is the Holy Spirit working through believers that show people the cross of Calvary. It is the Holy Spirit working through the apostles that show the whole world the love of Jesus Christ. It was the love that led them. And John said, I've got a lot to say, but I'd rather come to you and show you with my life the love. Now, here's the deal. If you had one opportunity to to go to a group of people and, and, and just as your life, with your life be the example that led to Jesus Christ, could you do it? Right now, I'm talking about without changing a thing in your life, could you go to this group of people and be the example that led them to Jesus Christ based on how you live right now? If they followed you to work, if they followed you to school, if they were up while you were brushing your dog breath teeth, and you were, they, were, they were listening to your iPod, and they were riding in your car, and they were following you to your, your, your private places, Okay, where you were, you, were, uh, you were done with church and you were done with what you had to do for the day and prayer service was over and they went to those places with you. Could your life be the example that led them to Jesus Christ? Sermons don't change people. Okay, churches don't change people. They grow people. Yes, we grow in the word of God. You know what changes people? When some, the Holy Spirit changes people when it works through you leading to good works that they may see your good deeds 
as the scriptures say, and glorify your Father in heaven. Say, man, I don't know what got into that girl. I don't know what got into that guy, but there's something crazy going on, and I want to be right close to it. Amen? I want to be right near that. John, letter C, last one. John wrote few words and said a lot. We could have much to say and live in such a way that we speak volumes. Speak volumes. Now, here's, here's my challenge for you guys as the band comes on up. My challenge for you guys is this. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by how you love, right? Let it never be said of each one of you in this room who now know the truth of what love looks like. Let it never be said that you had an opportunity to love somebody and chose to do the opposite. Well, Nate, you just don't know how this hurt me, how this situation hurt me. Let it never be said of people who know that we had a love opportunity to to extend Christ's love and chose not to do it. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and I thank you so much for this time. And I pray, Lord, as the song plays, Lord God, that you would reveal to us uh, the true heart of compassion that you have for people. Um, Let us not be uh, afraid or ashamed, Lord God, to show people the love that you've shown us and lay down our life for the sake of the world. Father, give us strength by your Holy Spirit to be ambassadors. Lord God, not, not exits to the faith. Lord God, but entrances. By your Spirit, let it be. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name.